Hello, I'm Seth Bilajari, and welcome again to another episode of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Haverhill Community Television and Pentecut Medical Cardiology. I'm Seth Bilazarian, a clinical and interventional cardiologist with Pentecut Medical, and I'm with my associate, Dr. Isaac Parati, a clinical cardiologist and electrophysiologist in our group. Dr. Parati has a specialty in arrhythmia and device implantation for the management of heart rhythm abnormalities. And he's with us today at my invitation with the hopes of, of reviewing some basic issues since I refer my patients to Dr. Parati for implantation of pacemakers and defibrillators and ad more advanced devices than that. I want to review for our audience so that was available for us uh, what happens from the beginning to the end when we send the patient for either the management of a slow heartbeat or a fast heartbeat or for one of these devices that can prevent the sudden arrhythmias of sudden death what happens? So I'll ask Dr. Parati, and hopefully we can get some insights about what happens. So take it away for us, Dr. Parati. What happens when I send a patient to you, let's say for an example, who needs one of these defibrillator devices because they're at high risk for sudden death? How does that work? Thank you for the invitation. So the uh, patients, when they come to my office, they're very anxious about what the procedure entails. And what I have prepared today is a few pictures and some explanations on the stages of what they uh, go through to have the implant and how they are followed up. And then after that, I'm open to questions. Great. So um, when you send the patient to my office, first I'll, explain, I'll sit down and talk to them. And we go through the, the uh, risks and the benefits and we decide what is the right device for them. Um, and at that time, I answer all, most of their questions, but still there remain some questions that we will uh, follow. We'll answer later. So I have some pictures. If you can uh, play the first one. This is my nurse at uh, my office. And what happens is after we uh, discuss the risks and the benefits, we uh, prepare for the, op for the procedure. It's a small operation. And before the uh, procedure, the, the patient requires some labs. We want to make sure there is no active infection. We want to make sure the kidney function is normal and uh, the, there's no abnormalities on the chest x-ray. And there's basically, you want to do this procedure without any infection present. If you have an infection at the time of the pacemaker or defibrillator implant, there's a risk for infection in, of that device. And that would be... Uh, um, for very it's difficult. Difficult. It's yes. a difficult situation. So we try to avoid that. So um, the labs are done at the time of uh, the visit. Then we schedule, my nurse schedules the patient for uh, the procedure at the location of um, their convenience and my availability. I, do, I tend to do my procedures at Anna Jakes, but we also do it at Leahy Clinic and Lawrence General. And um, can you go to the next picture, please? Okay. This is a patient of mine who kindly consented to have his pictures shown. Um, we don't take pictures of our patients, but this, is, this was just done for the purposes of this talk. And um, this is the preoperative area, where the patient comes in from home in the morning. They change to a gown. They go on a stretcher. And next picture, please. So they have an intravenous line in the arm, and that helps us give them medications to relax them. And uh, that takes care of the relaxation medications, the pain medications. This process of pacemaker or defibrillator implant is a um, procedure that does not require general anesthesia. It's, we manage it with conscious sedation, which means the patients are, are uh, sedated. They are kept comfortable by medications, but they are awake. They are done when they are awake. And that patch you see on the chest, there is a white patch on the chest. That one is um, a defibrillator patch, so that in case the procedure, uh, if the patient doesn't do well and there's any uh, complications, that's, our, that's how we shock the patient during the case. This is rarely used, but it's a safety measure that we use. Next picture, please. Okay, this is a team. That's the time in the preoperative room that you meet all the, all the staff that are going to be in the room with me. And it takes a lot of people to 
do a pacemaker or a defibrillator implant. Uh, we have two nurses. We have an uh, x-ray technician who runs the x-ray machine. And um, we have that uh, on the far right. That's the preoperative nurse who, who checks everything. And so everybody meets with the patient. Everybody's happy. Everybody's introduced. And um, that's when we go ahead and we go roll into the cath lab. OK, next picture, please. OK. This is in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. That's where the, the procedure is done. So um, this is a place, it's like an operating room, but it has an x-ray table. And the x-ray helps place the wires. It helps me place the wires in the right location. And before we get started, we clean the soap with soap and uh, some alcohol and betadine. That's that solution that uh, cleans the skin like any other operative procedure. And after that, next, next picture, please. After it's cleaned, we drape. And uh, everybody has a mask and uh, hat to prevent infection, including the patient. Next picture, please. This is a nurse at the head of the table who will administer the medications needed to keep the patient comfortable. And we speak to the patient. We say, are you comfortable? Are you anxious? Do you have any pain? And according to the response, we give more medications. And uh, to show you that he's still awake, I have him. Uh, next picture, please. Yeah, he, he gave us a thumbs up. Everything, he's awake. We are ready to go. OK. Next picture, please. OK. That's me standing on the left. And um, that x-ray tube is on top of the uh, patient to help us with the procedure. And we are basically, I'm going to open uh, the skin, make a space for that pacemaker, and uh, push the wires down a vein. There's a vein in the uh, shoulder that connects to the heart. And we use that vein as a conduit to go to the heart. Next picture, please. This is the wire that comes with the pacemaker or defibrillator. The pacemaker or the defibrillator, they, they have wires. Those wires are called leads. And the leads help the pacemaker or defibrillator know what's happening in the heart. And that's also how they pace the heart. And uh, they, uh, they go into the heart from the, from the shoulder, from that vein that I push it through. And next, next, picture, next picture, please. So on the x-ray, uh, what I can see is the wires are on the left shoulder on the, on the top right side of the screen. That's where the pacemaker is. And the wires uh, go from there down towards the heart. And the heart is that round thing in the, in the bottom of the picture. So um, this is a typical picture that we see in the cath lab. And that's how it helps me put the wires in the right place. So during this whole process, the patient is awake. There is local numbing medication given. And there is minimal pain, because the local uh, numbing medication takes away all the sharp pain. There's, they can feel me work there, but there's no pain. And anxiety is taken away by the medications. And I oftentimes ask them if they have any pain. And if they do have pain, we'll give them more, more medications. Next picture, please. OK. So this is the wound, and uh, the wires are coming out of the wound. There are two, there depends on the case. Uh, if the patient needs two wires, one wire, or three wires, there are different devices for different patients. This particular patient needed two wires. So you can see the two wires are coming out of the skin. The other end is in the heart. And next picture, please. <clears throat> This is one of the pacemakers that I put in this specific patient. It's a pacemaker that accepts two wires. And next picture, please. And you see how the wires go into the pacemaker. And they get screwed in so they don't move. And next picture, please. And the pacemaker is placed into the skin, under the skin. And next picture. We close the skin with sutures. Most of the sutures we use are absorbable sutures so that they don't have to be uh, picked again. They're, they dissolve under the skin. Next picture, please. And then after that, we cover the wound with these things called steri strips. These help the wound heal and also protect the wound from the patient scratching and touching it. And these steri strips are not supposed to be removed by the patient. They fall, on, they fall off on their own after a few weeks. And they're a protective measure. Next picture, please. 
Then we cover the stereo strips with uh, gauze and with uh, clear plastic dressing to protect it from infection. Usually I tell my patients that that plastic cover and the gauze, the white square, they can come off after a couple of days. And the stereo strips, they stay there for, for two weeks. Next picture, please. And this is a patient after the operation, and he has a coffee, coffee in his hand. He's, ready, he's eating. And what happens after the operation is they stay in the hospital overnight. The reason for that is we monitor for complications. There are potential complications from every operation, and we monitor for those. And the usual patient, if there is no complications and there is no adverse outcomes, they usually go home the next noon. Uh, what a fantastic uh, set of pictures you've shown from a recent patient, and that's fantastic. What a, what a beautiful job you did illustrating the implant of a two-wire pacemaker. Right. Can you tell us, would there be anything different that would have been uh, for, a, for a defibrillator in that case? Would it have been exactly the same, similar? How would it have been different? Excellent question. So a defibrillator is a bigger device. It's thicker and bigger. The reason for that is because it needs to have the energy to give the shock that um, the patient may need in the future. A defibrillator is a device that um, it's there to protect from death, from sudden death. And those are the arrhythmias that can kill you if they uh, persist. So back in the old days, uh, people used to uh, drop dead at home. And by the time the ambulance came and they came to the emergency room, it was already too late. They were dead. These devices, they are in, in the patient all the time. And they monitor the heart all the time. So that when that unforeseen um, sudden cardiac death happens, it automatically detects it and gives a shock. And so th these shocks need a lot of energy, and that's why they're bigger. Because they're bigger, the implant is a, little, is a little more difficult because you have to make a bigger pocket. The other thing that's different is during the defibrillator implant, we do an additional step. It's called the defibrillation testing. That's when we test the device to make sure it works. How that is is we put the patient in a heart rhythm that would otherwise kill them, and we wait for the defibrillator to kick in. And that's how we test the device to make sure it works. It's that, that, that extra step, it's called defibrillation testing. Okay. You mentioned that the, you did a great job explaining, but I don't think you mentioned to us how long would a pacemaker take and how long would a defibrillator take approximately for, for a normal patient okay. in the operating room. In the operating room, uh, Depends on the case because, uh, I, in my experience, the more obese the patient, the more challenging the case. Uh, and if it's a repeat case, and uh, this is also a little longer. But in a um, regular average patient, a pacemaker usually takes one hour. And that doesn't include the cleaning and the draping and all that. And the defibrillator implant usually takes 90 minutes. Okay, very good. So thank you for that. So that's really a wonderful review of the process from the referral to you for consultation, then a schedule at a local hospital. You mentioned Anna Jakes or Lawrence General, potentially Leahy Clinic or Mass General, other places you go, uh, depending on the patient's preference. And uh, ultimately, uh, the patient has this procedure. You mentioned they come in the morning of the procedure. They have the procedure, spend one night overnight and go home the next day. Then what? Good. So usually uh, what we have is um, most of all of the patients are recommended to either see me or their primary cardiologist in one week. The reason for that is we check for wound infection. Uh, we make sure there's no bleeding, make sure there's no pain. Um, it's, it's a wound check office visit. At the same time, sometimes if they have some complaints, let's say they feel like they, they have skipped heartbeats or... Uh, they don't feel normal. We check the device to make sure it's working fine. Um, and also, that's the time we introduce them for, we um, introduce them to follow up pacemaker clinics. And depending on the device, the pacemaker or the defibrillator needs to be followed every three to six months. Why? What are you, what are you doing at those visits when you check them? In the, in the typical follow-up visit, we check a few things. We, first, we check, make sure the battery is good. 
Secondly, we check to make sure the wires haven't moved or they haven't been dislodged. And there are tests we do to see if the, wire, the wires are intact or they're damaged. Third, we uh, check to see the programming, make sure that it doesn't need any changes. So every three to six months, it's almost like when you car take your car to the inspection. Uh, a pacemaker needs every uh, 12 months and a defibrillator needs to be checked every three months. Very good. So now tell us a little bit about these checks. Are they always done in the office? Do they have to come to your office? Can they be done elsewhere? Are there, ch are there opportunities to check in any other way other than coming to an office? Okay. So th this, with new technology, and depending on the patient preference, all of those are possible. There are some patients who feel comfortable in the office. They want to come in the office. If that's the case, we do it in the office. And in the office, it would be either myself or a pacemaker representative from the company who checks the pacemaker and if there's any problems, they'll notify me. Um, these days with internet and wireless technology, there are pacemakers and defibrillators that can be followed at home um, for their routine follow-up that, that they only need to be checked in the office once a year. Every other time they can be checked from home. Can you uh, show the next picture, please? This is a company, we have different competing pacemaker and defibrillator companies. And almost all of the companies now offer home monitoring. So this is a, a Medtronic, but it could be any other device. And this is a device that the patient takes home. Actually, they are mailed to them, they're FedExed. And they receive them a few weeks after the implant. And what you do is you call the 1-800 number of the company and they walk you, walk you through the steps, how to set it up. Next picture, please. So it, it needs to be plugged into the electricity and it needs to be plugged into the phone. And what it does, next picture, please. This is a typical patient. He's not my patient, he, he's from the company uh, picture. But you can see that um, he has that magnet on, over his chest. It's, it's a similar magnet that we use in the office. But that magnet transmits the information through the phone lines into a central computer. And that central computer uh, communicates the results to our office in, in a, a program, in a computer program. And so basically that automatically comes on my desk, printed out, as if the patient was in the office. And um, that is helpful in reducing unnecessary office visits. If the patient has transportation problems or... Um, inconvenience, let's say they, they have a full-time job, they don't want to come every three months. It's very reliable and very good for those patients. Great. Well, you've done a fantastic job now reviewing again for us consultation, implant with beautiful pictures and great graphic detail, follow-up, which is, you said, at least once a year in the office, and then maybe four, three other times during at home if, if the patient has the kind of device that allows wireless home monitoring. And you said this is pretty much available and maybe something that's discussed at the initial implant about which way to go. Right. What you didn't tell us, though, is, is what will the patient experience in terms of their life? So let's just take them one by one. Say a patient who has had a pa is having a pacemaker put in because their heart rate is very low. What might they feel? Are they going to feel something other than just the fullness of this thing in their left upper chest? What yes. else might they feel? Okay, excellent question. So um, like any other operation, there's going to be pain. There's going to be pain in the surgical site for the first few days, we, usually that pain is minor enough so that over-the-counter pain medications will allay those... It'll re like Tylenol? Yes, Tylenol. Okay. Tylenol. That's the most common thing. Sometimes patients are more sensitive. I give them some short-term, short, short, uh, short stronger pain medications. Okay. But for the first few months, they might feel that extra thing in their chest. And most patients, after one year, they don't even rec know that it's there. Okay. And as far as the pacing, they don't feel the pacemaker. So they don't know if the pacemaker is pacing or not pacing. The pacemaker is automatic, and it does its job when it needs to do it. So if a patient got a, a pacemaker, for instance, because their heart was very slow and they fainted, or they maybe were very fatigued, they might feel better right. and not have a fainting spell, but otherwise they wouldn't know they had the pacemaker. Right. So it acts like a safety net to protect them, but otherwise they don't know it's there. Right. That's a great deal.
So now tell us about the defibrillator. What would a patient experience with a defibrillator if it was put in because they were at very high risk for that problem you described, sudden cardiac death, and they hadn't had that problem, but they were at risk for it, so it was chosen to put it in to protect them. Other than what you described, the fullness, the wound healing, after a few weeks, what might they experience? Okay, great. Great question. So same, same issues with the wound. And these uh, patients are, as you say, picked because they're high risk. So they tend to have more arrhythmias. They, ten they tend to have more extra beats, fast beats. Um, if the device picks up a dangerous heartbeat, it automatically activates. And what it first tries to do is it tries to stop the fast heartbeat without shocking them. If it fails to do so, it needs to give the shock, and it will give the shock. And it, unfortunately, there is no warning. Sometimes the patients feel dizzy, they feel like their heart races, and then they feel the shock. The shock can be painful. It, it is most often painful. But it's a pain uh, that we have to accept in order to save a life. So those patients who get a shock, what I tell them is if you only get one shock and you feel okay, after the shock you feel fine and it's in the middle of the night, you can call me the next day or call the hospital ne the next day. Usually they call me. If the shock um, repeats, they should call 911. Because whatever the problem was, it, it wasn't fixed by the first shock. It's happening again. And usually if you get more than one shock, you, are, you tend to get more shocks. So you call 911. When you come to the emergency room, the doctor figure out, will figure out what happened. So first shock, you feel okay, you stay home. Unless if it's in the middle of the day, you, come, you call me that time. But if it's in, uh, in the middle of the night, I mean, that, that's the time where you wait till the next day. So not every shock means emergency room. And any double shock is 911. You call 911. Don't try to drive to the hospital. The one group of patients that we didn't talk about, just to review, we talked about pacemakers, which are a device that's used for slow heartbeats. We talked about defibrillators, which are devices used for fast heartbeats that can kill you. But we didn't talk about a kind of device that uses three wires that can help people with a weak heart. These devices are called uh, resynchronization devices or biventricular pacemakers. And um, I've sent several patients to you for this procedure. It's very similar in terms of the implant, what's involved, except there's a third wire instead of the two that you showed. And it's more technically challenging for you to put that third wire in because it has to go into a very special place in the heart. That's not that interesting for our audience, but I'd like you to tell us what could a patient experience with that if they got one of those devices and they have this congestive heart failure, fatigue and shortness of breath from their problem with their heart. Good. This is a very exciting field in cardiology. This is one of the times that we can help the patient feel better. And uh, actually, it may improve their heart function. It's, it's a device that is used for congestive heart failure, as you said. And it's most useful in patients who have a weak heart. And um, we have to carefully select the patients to make sure that they'll benefit from this extra wire. Uh, for, for those patients who we select that they're good candidates for this Cadillac pacemaker, which has three wires, for those patients, most often they feel better after the, after the implantation of that um, pacemaker with three wires. What do you mean by feel better? Tell us what a patient might, they, might tell you about that they, follow they up. They tend to have more energy, be able to walk more before, you, before they get short of breath, um, less, basically less shortness of breath and more energy. That's okay. the most common. Great. And is there anything different about those three wire or Cadillac system that you described with regard to follow up or was it? Follow up is similar. It's okay. similar to a regular pacemaker. And those devices that have three wires almost always have the option of giving the shock. Yes. But sometimes they may not have, the, we, you can choose to have one with the shock or without. Can you yes. tell us about that? It depends on the patient. So um, yes. Most, I, I can, in my practice, 90% of those uh, pacemakers with the three wires also have a defibrillator because those patients also have a weak heart, and a weak heart is a risk factor for the dangerous heartbeat. So they have the defibrillator and the third wire in one system, in one package. 
there's there's a few group of uh, my patients that they don't want to be shocked. They just want to feel better. But they, they, they are comfortable with the risk that if, you know, God forbid, if that happens, that, uh, that they have the dangerous arrhythmia. So that, so that might be a patient who's very old. Say yes, a an older patient. Late, late 70s or early 80s yes. who has a lot of shortness of breath, has a weak heart, right. and you think that they might benefit by the three-wire system, right. but they're content that if something happens and their heart does stop, stop they don't want to be shocked. Right, exactly. So, so that is an option for That's some patients. Great. Well, what a fantastic tour de force of device implantation issues. You took fantastic pictures of a recent patient in the cath lab, operating room, what the patient can experience. This is a wonderful teaching tool for us, for our patients, to see what will happen from the consultation to implant to follow-up, what patients can expect afterward to feel. And we thank you for your expertise and review today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Isaac Parati, my associate in electrophysiology, who accepted my invitation today to come to review device implantation. And he uh, did a lot of work to prepare these, uh, these beautiful pictures of what happened so our patients can know beforehand. And we hope that those of you who will uh, uh, consider this procedure will benefit by this information. So until next time, I'm Dr. Seth Bilazarian from Pawtucket Medical Associates Cardiology. And from Haverhill Community Television, I thank you and good night.